A lot of times, people oppose two of the main things that we do. That is, research versus teaching. And to me, I don't think they're opposed. I think that they cross-fertilize. They each reinforces the other. And I'd like to briefly explain to you why I think that's the case. But along the way, something about some of my experiences over the last 37 years. So of course we start our research with questions. Questions are more important than the answers because the questions really determine in what fields we're going to seek answers. Uh, if we don't ask questions about what the history of women is, we're not going to find the answers. If we don't ask what the history of the Jews is, we're not going to find any answers about it. So the most important thing is the questions that we formulate. And then we do research in order to find the answers. But of course, research is very difficult. And the first reason why it's difficult is because the threshold is so high. First, you have to learn everything that's known about your subject. And then you have to acquire the tools to create new knowledge about your subject, languages, methodology. And then there are the problems of uh, logistics. You have to go to cold places. <laughs> I, should, I should mention that my wife, Lynn, uh, often says to me, you had to pick the Jews of Poland, you couldn't pick the Jews of the Caribbean. <laughs> Except that I once met somebody who did pick the Jews at the Caribbean, <laughs> a Jewish ethnomusicologist, and he said, believe me, it's no fun to sit in the bathroom because it's the strongest room in the house, clutching your computer when the hurricane hits. <laughs> and just to give you an idea of how difficult research can be, my first day doing real archival research was in September of 1977, I sat in the Central Archive for the History of the Jewish People, which was then in the basement of Sprinsack. Not a very imposing Central Archive for the History of the Jewish People. And beginner's luck, there were uh, microfilms there that Jakob Goldberg had sent from Poland in the 1950s and 60s, and uh, I found and the very first microfilm I opened, uh, a letter from the widow of the rabbi of Shin, uh, Shinyava. Shinyava was one of the towns that I was studying. I was studying Jews and Shinyavsky Chartoriski Latifundium. And there it was, a letter from the rabbi's wife from Shinyava. And boy, did I get excited. My very first attempt. And then I rolled the, the film to the place, and I couldn't read one word. <laughs> the handwriting, the handwriting. Tears came to my eyes. And I had to start copying letter by letter, until finally I learned how to read the handwriting. So the threshold is very high. But once you cross the threshold, archival research gives you unspoken pleasures. And I just want to give you a few examples. So you all have heard about this book. Some of you may have even read it. <laughs> so first I want to explain the title. How did I get the title? I was in Miluin, reserve duty. Uh, artillery exercise. And my Miluin reading was Herman Woke's Winds of War. A nice thick book. And as my uh, fellow soldier said, and it's in English. <laughs> and in that book, there is a character, Professor Aaron Jastro, who taught history at Yale University. And there's a graduate student who needs to talk to him, and he finally finds him at his uh, villa in Siena, Italy. So he comes to this beautiful villa, and he says, Professor, how did you afford to buy a place like this? He says, well, you know, 
uh, I used to teach the juniors at Yale a course called The Jewish Roots of Christianity, The Jewish Roots of Christianity. And I decided to write a book. And I wrote the book, and I was just going to send it to the publisher, and I looked at the title. Who's going to want to read a book like that, The Jewish Roots of Christianity? So I changed it, and I called it A Jew's Jesus. <laughs> a Jew's Jesus, and became a bestseller. And here's my villa. So I said, I can, I can do what Herman Hoke does. <laughs> and I started thinking about it, and I came up with the Lord's Jews. No villa in Siena. <laughs> anyway, Jacob Engel, who was mentioned here a couple of times, in his autobiography, Megillat Sefer, mentions that his father, Chacham Svi Ashkenazi, who was kicked out of the rabbinate in Amsterdam uh, as a result of a Sabbatean controversy, he was on the wrong side, he was anti sabbatean and started wandering around Europe, he was in England, he was in a few places in Germany, and finally, Emden says that a very a prominent wealthy Jew in Poland took him in. And this is what he says. The famous and praiseworthy Reb Yisrael Ritfin, Ritfin is the Jewish version of the town of Fiani, an official called Ekonom of the great magnate Shinyavska. Reb Yisrael was appointed chief administrator and authority over all the income and expenses of that magnate. He was very rich, God-fearing, and clear-thinking. He took my father and his family under his stewardship, and according to Emden, uh, the Chacham Tzvi stayed there four years, for wonderful years, everything was taken care of, everything was paid for, a kol cheshbon baron, a Lord's Jew, and uh, finally he then went to be the rabbi in, everyone's saying, Lviv these days, uh, where he died. Okay, we can assume these were real people, right? Yaska and Yisrael Rufin, what do we know about them? Well, of course, we know a lot about Bezbeta Shinyaska. She owned about 700 towns and villages all over uh, Poland, Lithuania. She was called the uncrowned queen of Poland. She was involved in all sorts of diplomacy. She was an extremely important person. But who was Israel Ritfi? Well, it turns out that Israel Rifin worked for her. What? Drop the microphone. Drop the microphone. Israel Rifin worked for Yosbeta Shinyaska. And despite the fact that she was this very wealthy, powerful uh, Polish noble lady, magnate, uh, they had quite a correspondence. So, for example, in response to charges against him, that he was corrupt, that he was incompetent. Uh, he wrote, this is all anti-Semitism. I have been at the here for several decades. A Catholic manager would be called at but I, with the title of Pisash, that is a uh, clerk, oversee everything. In the worst of years, when there was a flood or ruinous calamities, the property generated up to 60,000 zloty. So, we have no fewer than 400 letters that Israel Rubinovich, which just means Ben Ruvain, uh, of Ritviani wrote to Chinyavska and her administrators, and we can create a biography of this man whom Emden mentions. So, the feeling when you find something like this is just amazing. In addition to which, it's very important because it shows, as was also mentioned earlier, that Polish and Jewish sources complement each other and that you can't have one without the other. You must have both. <coughs> Another example. Oops. Yes. Uh, now, research uh, takes you in all sorts of directions. Uh, I should explain. I did my PhD in America, uh, the Jewish Theological Seminary, with all the Polish stuff at Columbia. 
Now, I believe then, and I believe now, that when you enter your dissertation de defense, and in America, unlike Israel, you have to do a defense in front of five or six experts in the different areas that touch on your dissertation. When you walk in the room for your defense, everyone should already know that you know more about the topic than anybody else before you open your mouth. That should be clear. Therefore, I intentionally defined my topic to end in 1740 because I did not want to touch Hasidism. <laughs> Everybody and his sister thinks they're an expert in Hasidism. Everybody who writes about the 18th century writes about Hasidism. So I was not going to get into Hasidism. Okay? Now, so, there is a maxim. If you are looking for something in an archive, you will find out, you will end up finding many things. If you are just looking, you probably won't find anything. And I could cite some books like that, but I won't. <laughs> Where the author says, I was just looking and looking and looking, you couldn't find anything. Well, I arrived at the Chartarisky Library on December the 5th, 1978. And you have to remember, this was communist Poland. And uh, Marching Sun once asked him, if you didn't have computers, how did you get on the internet? <laughs> Well, not only wasn't there an internet, uh, there was no mail between Poland and uh, America, I mean, to speak of. And I had no way of knowing what was in that archive except by talking to people like Jakob Goldberg, uh, reading footnotes that were written in articles before the war. Uh, so I knew that it was there, <laughs> but exactly what was there I didn't know. So the first day in the archive, I hungrily opened uh, one of the two onion skin printed, a uh, typed catalogs. It wasn't a card catalog, it was uh, <coughs> bound onion skin. And I discovered for the first time that the Chartariskis, Chernyavskis and the Chartariskis, uh, among their possessions, was the town of Mienzbuz. That is the town where the Baal Shem Tov spent the last 20 years of his life. Well, you know, archaeologists say, you make your own luck. <laughs> and this, of course, was luck. It took quite a number of years to prepare for it. But you didn't have to be a genius to say if the Baal Shem Tov really lived, and if he was important, then he should be there. But I decided I'm not ordering the files. Why? Number one, I had a mission. I had limited time. I had to come out of there with a doctorate. I had left my wife, three children. If I didn't come home with the basis for a doctorate, I didn't have to come home. So I did not want to be diverted from my mission. And secondly, I was a bit afraid. What if he wasn't there? Or worse, what if he was there but he wasn't the Baal Shem Tov? What if he was just a, a teamster or a bartender or something like that? So I resisted for about six weeks. I did not uh, order the files. Now, January the 1st, <coughs> 1979, was the coldest day in 20 years uh, in Eastern Europe. And January, First, of course, everyone was, was off January the 2nd. I come to the archive, and uh, I always got there early, just when they opened. And I go to, to enter, and the guard says, it's closed. I said, what do you mean it's closed? He said, it's too cold. <laughs> there's no heat. Now, the reading room was on the fourth floor of the Chartreuse Library. And I said, there's never any heat, <laughs> because the heat didn't get up that high. I sat there the entire winter in my gloves and coat. And he said, well, I'm sorry, it's closed to the public. And I just stood there with my mouth open. 
And then I saw that the staff was going into work. So I said, what is this? this? They're going to work? Why can't I go in? He said, they have to work. It's close to the public. <clears throat> well, I said, you must let me go in and talk to the director, Dr. Hometsky. So he said, OK. I said, went in. I said, you know, I have to get my work done. I left my wife, my children. You know. <laughs> he said, you're right, but I can't let you into the reading room. You'll work in my office. <laughs> OK, so the next two weeks, you can see I'm the only person signed in. And I worked in his office, and he became very friendly because every day at 11 o'clock, he had tea. He would invite me to join him for tea. And I got to ask all my questions. And even after the archive, the reading room opened, I continued. Every day at 11 o'clock, the page would come to me and say, Dr. Homeski invites you for tea. OK. Finally, uh, after feeling comfortable and feeling that I really was going to come out of this with enough material for the doctorate, uh, on January the 15th, I ordered the files. And within 15 minutes, this is what I found. The uh, list of ch the chinch taxpayers, the real estate taxpayers, in Manzibuj, and among them was Balsham Doctor, Dr. Balsham, who was uh, exempt from tax, and this showed up in uh, six or seven other years, and it's clear that the house he lived in was a house that belonged to the uh, Kihila. He lived in it rent-free and tax-free, and eventually, as you know, I wrote a book about it, and, uh, but the point is, you never know what you're going to find, what direction you're going to go in. I had no intention of ever dealing with Hasidism. As Yehuda Levis said to me once, the Rebbe touched you and you couldn't let go. The Rebbe touched you. Now, uh, another letter to Shinyavska by a different Jew, this one named Moises, that is Moshe Fortis, uh, is dated the 21st of March, 1721, with the time of day, 3 o'clock. Now, March the 1st, 1721, was a Friday. Shabbat started <coughs> in southern Poland around 5.40. So let's assume he gave himself a little leeway. He wrote to her, I profoundly regret that I cannot fulfill my lady's order today because I only have three hours until Shabbat. Now, again, this to me is a very significant letter. Not only does it show that Jews were observing Shabbat, but here's a Jew who's not afraid to say to his lady, and I again emphasize this was not just some uh, owner of a village. We're talking about one of the elite of Polish society. Uh, I'm sorry, Shabbat comes first. So, uh, again, you find something like this, and it just makes you feel like you're in the cops. Now, you can also do research in material that's not archival. This is a tachina that was printed in Lvov in the late 1780s. Lviv, excuse me. <laughs> in the late, <laughs> that I'm not going to say. Lemberg. I said Lemberg. It is. It was written by a lady named Sara Rivka Racha Lea Horvitz. Uh, her friends called her Lea Horvitz. Gershon Hunter's best friend, Bear Bolochov, tells us about her in his memoir, that when he was 12 years old, he went to the rabbis on Shabbat afternoon. And the rabbi said to him, here's a sugya in the Gemara, please study it. I'm taking my nap. When I wake up, I'll test you. So Bear says he's trying to break his head to understand the Talmud, and he can't. But who's sitting there? The rabbi's sister, Marat Leah. And she says, what's the problem? And he tells her he can't understand it, and she, he tells us by heart, recites the Talmud, the Gemara, with the Rashi, and teaches it to him. 
In the 19th century, she's legendary, long after she died, as the learned Marat Lea. Well, she published this uh, eight-page booklet. The heart of it is a Yiddish tachina to be said on Shabbat Mavartim in the synagogue, the Shabbat before Rosh Chodesh in Yiddish, with an Aramaic translation and a Hebrew introduction. So why the Aramaic translation? I'm convinced she was showing off. <laughs> Anything you can do, I can do better. <laughs> <laughs> and the Hebrew introduction is obviously addressed to the rabbis. And she says all sorts of things. I call her the Jewish Mary Wollstonecraft. <laughs> if you know who Jew Mary Wollstonecraft, she's a late 18th, early 19th century uh, English feminist figure, one of the mothers of feminism. Here we have a lady who's a generation older than her and Jewish who expresses many of the same ideas. So just to give you a taste, I want to read one passage with you. So Leah says in her Hebrew introduction, in the Talmud, Rabbah said, according to our Talmud, it's about Chia, but we won't argue, how do women gain merit? By bringing their sons to the synagogue to study and waiting for their husbands until they return from the Bet Midrash. This is strange. <laughs> women are commanded to observe the 365 negative commandments, and there is a principle. If one sits back, and refrains from sinning, he merits a reward. So what does this mean? Women get mitzvah points only by facilitating men's mitzvot. Women have their own mitzvot. 365 mitzvot lo ta'aseh. Not only that. In addition, Maimonides Rambam wrote in his Sefer HaMitzvot that of the 60 positive commandments that still apply to individuals in these post-temple times, in other words, of the 248, Positive mitzvot say Only 60 apply to individual people after the temple was destroyed. So in other words, we have 365 negative commandments that apply to everybody, 60 positive commandments that apply to men, 60 and 365 is 425. Not much less than the men's. Four hundred. That is, excuse me, I skipped. Women are commanded to observe 46 of them. Women are exempt from mitzvot asesha as man grama, time-bound positive commandments. Of the 60, there's only 14 of those. So in other words, women have 411 mitzvot. Men have 425. It is difficult to understand why Rabbi did not find merits for women other than those he mentioned. So we have our Mary Wollstonecraft. Uh, <laughs> The Jew. Okay, so these are examples of the rewards of research. When you find things like this, there's just nothing like it. It makes you feel like it was all worth it. All of the study, all of the languages, all of the hardship. <laughs> now, there's another bonus from archival research. It makes your teaching come alive. When you teach what you've discovered, it, you're not just re repeating, reciting things you've read in a book. You're making your students partners in the discovery. And you're, giving, you're also trying it out. You're trying out your ideas and getting the reaction from them. I mean, in the process of uh, getting something ready to publish, the first thing you do is try it out with your students. And for them, it makes the class exciting. It makes them feel like they have something to say also, because they're reacting to something new, something that hasn't been chewed over already. So teaching, uh, so research vivifies your teaching. But also, This book came out of teaching. But before I discuss that, I have to tell you the story of the cover. <coughs> this is not the cover I wanted. And Connie Weber, my publisher, is sitting here. We had quite a lively correspondence. I wanted the cover to reflect the ambiguity of Jewishness today. Now, I have a brother who is 
uh, very much in the film industry. And uh, I dared to think that there was a possibility that he could get in touch with Madonna. And as you know, Madonna is very sympathetic to things Jewish. Madonna also recorded the theme song for the 2002 movie, Die Another Day, John James Bond. And with the movie, there was a video. And the video includes quite a few scenes with Madonna wearing tefillin. And so I proposed that we put Madonna. <laughs> and the response of Lippmann was, this is not us. This is not our brand. And as I look at it, I realize they had a point. <laughs> so then somebody suggested, instead of Madonna, we put this on the cover. <laughs> Ambivalence of Jewishness today. Well, this time it was my brand that was in question. I was not going to have a Christmas tree on my book. <laughs> And so we compromised. And this was the compromise. This is a picture taken by Frederick Brenner, a French photographer who goes all over the world uh, photographing Jews in unusual situations. And in 1993, in Billings, Montana, somebody threw a rock through the window of a Jewish family that had a kanukia menorah in their window. So Brenner read about this. And a year later, on the anniversary of when it happened, he gathered the good townspeople of Billings, gave them all plastic menorahs. I, I should say, after the rock was thrown, the next day, uh, there was a demonstration supporting the Jews. There was a front page editorial in the paper, this is not us. So uh, the town turned out to celebrate uh, Hanukkah. And, uh, so we decided, well, okay, this is acceptable. Anyway, this book grew out of teaching. Uh, I was on sabbatical at the University of Michigan in 1989, where I was introduced to the whole subject of postmodernism. And uh, this was a crisis for me, because if it threatened history, as we heard uh, not to talk about it, it threatened Jewish history even more. Uh, how could I continue in my profession uh, without dealing with this? And so I decided to start teaching a course uh, on methodology, or I should say the course existed, and I decided to teach it with this slant to, to explore the challenges of postmodernism. And after teaching it for about 10 years, I felt ready uh, to write about it. But I could never have done it without the give and take with the students. This is Rabbi Michelle Masagia, a reform rabbi in California. But again, in 1989, I was teaching a survey course in Eastern European Jewish History at the University of Michigan. And the lecture that day happened to be about economic life of the Jews in Poland in the 17th and 18th centuries. And after about half an hour, she raises her hand and says, uh, what does all this have to do with women? <laughs> and without any preparation, I was, started talking about women in the economy, the Jewish economy in Poland. Uh, and I realized there's a subject here. If I could talk about it for 20 minutes without preparing, <laughs> what could I do if I did prepare? <clears throat> and ever since then, I've been exploring the question of uh, Jewish women's history, and I'm trying to write a book about the history of Jewish women in uh, the Polish Lithuanian Commonwealth. And that's all thanks to Michelle Masagia, a student who asked a question. So teaching and research to me, are vital components of one process. And uh, now, of course, I'm not going to be able to teach. So I hope uh, that I'll still 
be able to produce some kind of worthwhile research, but uh, it's going to be more difficult. And now, <coughs> both Gershon, Bacon this time, and I were consultants to the Polian Museum in Warsaw. And this taught me about a new kind of teaching, the museum as a teaching tool. When I go through that museum, and I've spent many hours there, I feel as if somebody took everything that we've all been doing <laughs> the last 30 years and made a movie out of it. <laughs> Except it's a movie that you can walk into. Uh, it's just an exhilarating feeling to walk around there and to see <laughs> all of our research uh, come alive. And obviously, people appreciate it because they had already to the museum as a whole, two and a half million visitors in three years, and a million to the permanent exhibit, which uh, I think says that it really is an effective teaching tool. Yes. So, I just want to sum up some of the new conclusions of that research, ones that I think won't be overturned by what we've heard in the lectures uh, today. Uh, Several of the lectures have made me realize that uh, a lot of what I said is obsolete, which is okay, because what it did was to push other people to go into new directions, find new sources, new interpretations, and that's what we do. But in the meantime, I think we have established that the 18th century was not a period of constant crisis. If we look at the economic uh, status of the Jews in many places, most places. We look at the public building going on, uh, all of the synagogues that were built. Uh, we look at prices. We look at uh, correspondence with people like Shinyavska. Uh, it's not true that Tachtat, the Khmelnytsky uh, persecutions, were still uh, cast their shadow over uh, the Jews of Poland and Ukraine. Also, corollary of that, Hasidism was not born out of persecution. Hasidism was born in stability and security. And something else, you notice that the, last, uh, the second to the last session about Hasidism, all the lectures were about Hasidism in the 19th and 20th centuries. 21st, okay. If uh, the session had been held 30 years ago, I'm sure that they all would have talked about the 18th century. Now what has happened, and it's not just me, it's others as well, have shown that the, uh, first of all, the, the Baal Shem Tov did not found a movement in the 19th century uh, sense of that word. We won't get into the details. Uh, that the movement <coughs> was formed in a gradual process through the late 18th and early 19th century, and that's really the 19th century where we have uh, classical Hasidism, uh, mature Hasidism, as you heard today in lectures today, which reflect this. And I claim that the 18th century was a time of, or I should say the entire early modern period, was a time of Jewish women's cultural capital rising gradually. What do I mean by that? Well, Tachino, that are supposed to be said in the synagogue, tells you that women are in the synagogue. Uh, that maligned, much maligned institution of the Mechitza, as Nashim, the women's section, to me, is the opposite of oppressing women. Uh, until the late 16th, early 17th century, uh, it seems that women were guests in the Ashkenazic synagogue. They came in for special occasions to hear a sermon, to hear the shofar blown, to hear the Birkat Kohanim. But beginning in the late 16th, early 17th century, uh, synagogues are remodeled, new synagogues are built with women's sections. So the women are in the building, unlike Elvis. <laughs> so, uh, and then there's a library that women have access to, a Yiddish library that I know is not just for women, but women, it is also for women. Uh, and if we can have a marginal woman 
like Leia Horvitz, well, the margin tells you where the center is. True, she was marginal, but if the margin is here, the center is here. If the margin is here, the center is here. So women are gradually going from being cultural observers to cultural actors. And as we heard last night, Jews were both in and of Poland, and Gershon Hundert's famous phrase, Jews, there were Jews and other Poles. Jews were a kind of Pole as well. <coughs> and the story, the overall story, the meta-narrative, is a story of achievement and stability punctuated by discrimination and persecution. And I should say, a few years ago, Gershon wrote an article searching for a metaphor. What is the proper metaphor to uh, describe the Jewish experience in Poland? So I'd like to propose two metaphors. I, I have proposed two metaphors. One is a marriage of convenience. Now, marriage of convenience is not based on love. It's based on utility. However, uh, it takes on a dynamic of its own. Uh, it may actually lead to some kind of love, and it may not. Uh, it may be that the partners resent each other from time to time and even act out against each other from time to time, but because of the basic utility that they both feel, they stay married. So I throw that out as a possible metaphor. And another one, which you heard last night again, categorically Jewish, distinctly Polish, and to me, a great example of this is the centerpiece of the Pauline Museum, the model of the Bozdziec Synagogue, which you look at it, uh, especially if you looked at the real thing, you would see that it's obviously a synagogue, but it's also obviously Polish, Ukrainian, let's call it Eastern European. So, that in a nutshell is the message that uh, I will leave, and I guess what will be my last lecture in this uh, building. <laughs> like this, but uh, in the event, I was wrong. Uh, the things I've heard last night and today, I realized that uh, it's a very worthwhile event for our field. And if we were the excuse for it, so be it. Uh, now, when I was a boy, uh, my parents would talk about some of my father's cousins. And actually, two of them are sitting here right now. Who got fellowships uh, for graduate study and postgraduate study. And so I asked, what's a fellowship? And they said, well, they pay you to go to school. <laughs> Wow, that is unbelievable. How can they pay somebody to go to school? <laughs> to me, that was just outlandish. I, I, I couldn't get my head around that. You get paid to go to school? So, in September 1967, I walked in as a freshman to Boston University, and I never left the university. <laughs> and I even got fellowships. But one thing I didn't get, 
and that is, I've been to many, many, many universities, and I keep asking, when is it going to be my turn to sit on the grass? In any case, when I was in Poland the first time in Warsaw, uh, I met with someone who was one of the preeminent Polish historians of the day, and it wasn't easy being in communist Poland and not being a communist. That was Professor Aleksandr Gieszczor. And I had some questions to ask him, and I felt very appreciative that this very important professor was talking to me, a lowly graduate student, a foreigner. And I said to him, you know, I apologize for bothering him. And he said, no, we're all part of the Respublikan Literarum, the Republic of Letters, of the Literary Republic. And that stayed with me. Also, Shmuel Feiner in his book talks a lot about the Haskala Republic of Letters. And I realized I'm really part of a Republic of Letters like the Maskilim. We're talking about several hundred people all over the world uh, who are constantly relating to each other. Uh, conferences today, we have email. We're constantly emailing back and forth, uh, reading each other's things, writing critiques. Uh, it's really a great privilege that I've had since 1967 to be in the academic world and to be part of this Republic of Letters. So uh, the first component, of course, is colleagues. And the first colleague is Gershon, who has been not just my office mate, but my intellectual partner, my research partner, and stimulus, and my friend. And then, the colleagues in the department. Uh, so I often say the department's like the shuk. Uh, everybody has his basta. There are people that you compete with. There are people that you cooperate with. There are people you have no uh, relationship with. There are people that you have a rather, as uh, Al Baumgarten once used the word, complected relationship with. We'll leave it at that. Uh, but, it certainly was a place where I was allowed to do my work and to decide myself what I was going to do, when I was going to do it, how I was going to do it. And I must say that unlike other people, uh, my personal path toward the promotion, etc., was very smooth and I was very, very lucky. So I'm happy about that. So that's the colleagues. But then there's a, a wider circle uh, of, I mean, there's colleagues in the university, but then colleagues all, all over in Poland and Ukraine and Lithuania and England and France and America and different places, and I'm sure I'm leaving out places, Prague, uh, people that I'm in contact with all the time uh, who enrich my intellectual life who support my research, who make me feel that there is meaning to what I'm doing. And I'm very thankful for that. Uh, and then, of course, students, uh, many students. Uh, I'm very thankful for the students I've had, both undergraduate and graduate. Uh, and a few students have even become colleagues uh, Yaron Harel was, was here. He was once chair of our department. Yitzhak Conforti is in our department. Uh, Hagi Cohen in the Open University. And I have one student who became a colleague and then became my teacher, and that's Margie, of course. So uh, I feel very blessed with all of this. And then there's the wider circle. I've already mentioned my publisher. Uh, sitting here is a woman who typed the manuscript of my first book, because in those days, the typist typed on the computer. If you didn't type on the computer, she was from Goldberg. And my translator, who makes me look good in Polish, probably better than I sound in English, Agnieszka <laughs> Jagosinska. So, uh, and then all of you, I'm not going to try to mention everybody's name, uh, but all of you who have been partners with me in, on this journey. And then finally, there is my family. So uh, 
My father, Norman, who died about a year and a half ago, but was always extremely supportive of everything I did. And my mother, Elaine, uh, there are very, very few parents who get to see their child retire. <laughs> and I'm very appreciative that she's here and able to, especially since most things were in English, able to uh, share in what I do. And then, of course, there's our children who uh, lived for a long time with a father who was absent for months at a time. When I would go to the research, and I never felt uh, resentment or anger or anything like that, and I, I'm thankful to them. And then, of course, most of all, <laughs> <laughs> is Lynn Shali uh, Vishalachem Shala. She always chose to identify everything that I was doing as part of our joint uh, project together. <coughs> and for that, I'm very thankful. So, thank you all for coming, and on to tomorrow. <laughs>